So welcome everyone. It is such an honor to be with you all here today. Welcome this wonderful, what a wonderful way to start Thursday morning. Welcome to our event uh, called Nerve Lessons on Leadership from Two Women Who Went First. My name is Charlotte Karam and I am the director of the Executive MBA program here at Telfer at the University of Ottawa. I am also an associate professor at, at Telfer and my area of research very much vibes with the conversation that we're going to have here today, which is on inclusive HR systems and women's careers. So welcome to the Center of Executive Leadership. Our learning facility actually hosts the Executive MBA as well as Telfer Executive Programs, including, some of you may be very interested to hear, the Boundless Leadership Program, which is focuses on women's careers and women's leadership um, career pathways. For those of you at home, there's the link in the chat um, for you to, to, to take a look at our executive programs that are here at the center. But before jumping in, um, in seeing that we are at the uh, University of Ottawa and that we are located in Ottawa, our tradition is to share the indigenous affirmation before every event, virtual and in person. So I'd like to read that now. We pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. We acknowledge their long-standing relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We pay respect to all indigenous people in this region from all nations across Canada who call Ottawa home. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. So to why we're all gathered here today, we're here to celebrate two extraordinary, extraordinary women. And I've had the pleasure to have a few conversations leading up to this event. And I can tell you, you feel like you're sitting with your, your BFFs. You feel like you're sitting with people you can really, really connect with. Um, they've, uh, they have two women who were, were we um, have taken on leadership roles, have taken on leadership of the first presidencies of Canadian universities, and were willing to take the risks that are associated with leadership um, when these opportunities presented themselves. So there's a lot to learn, a lot to ask, and a lot to engage with. So thank you both for being here. I'd like to they note that they co-wrote together, which is quite wonderful to see, to see two authors co-writing together the book. Again, the name Nerve, Lessons on Leadership from Two Women Who Went First. So in today's discussion, we will talk about the importance of mentorship, the importance of sponsorship. We'll talk about the stumbling blocks uh, or hurdles that they've experienced or have to uh, overcome and how they navigated those career paths. Um, there are enduring stereotypes about women's leadership capacities um, and a lot of people still hold these stereotypes and are more, um, more putting more barriers perhaps for women to move into these upper level management. But there's the flip side of that as well, which is the often the feeling of fear or anxiety in stepping into a role of leadership. Mm -hmm. um, in your book, you discuss something called the reluctant bride syndrome and its presence and mm -hmm. its continued presence presence. Can you please explain to us what that term means and, and how it kind of plays out in this? Yeah. And I think this is really important to understand because, you know, it's a, it, it's, it's a bit risky to generalize because uh, not all women maybe have it, but more women than men have this, what we call the reluctant bride syndrome. Headhunter calls a woman. She says, me? No, not ready. How about Martha over here, you know, call her, um, calls a guy. He says, geez, I've been waiting for your call. Here's my resume. It's in the mail. <laughs> Women, and these are statistics. There's a book called Confidence Code that we refer to in the book. Women will only apply for a job if they have 100% of the qualifications. Men will go after it at 50, right? So I think it's important to recognize the presence of that in each one of us to different degrees. And then to say when you get that call, pause, right? And ask yourself, really, uh, do you want to be, uh, do, do you not want to sort of go get, this is a natural reaction, I must uh, do that. I'll give you, a, a, and then it comes to how people should recruit women, because that's the second corollary mm -hmm. of it, right? So when I got the call from the chair of the Board of Governors, Jim Edwards, the Honorable Jim Edwards, uh, I was busy decorating my house and I was thinking about paint colors and, you know, all that stuff. And this call comes out of the blue. 
we are looking for a president for the University of Alberta. Will you be a candidate? And I go, no, 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 not interested. Almost slightly rude, actually. He said, I'll call you back in six weeks. Think about it. Now, the message in that was that here was someone who was trying to recruit a person who knew that perhaps women were reluctant, I was reluctant, and was willing to take a different strategy. He could have said, thank you very much, bye. He didn't. Call me back in six weeks. The answer was still, uh, I don't know, I'm not sure. Are you free for dinner next week? I'm getting on a plane, and we're going to have dinner. Yeah. Right? This went on for around 10 weeks or something. Thank goodness. He did not take no for an answer. When I finally did my homework and realized what an incredible opportunity this was, what an incredible university I was being asked to lead. And if I was so lucky to get the job, I would be able to advance this institution because it had the most amazing alumni, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, Beverly McLaughlin, Dean of Medicine at Harvard, all U of A alumni. What was I thinking? But then when I finally decided to throw my hat in the ring, he said to me, you understand, you now have to compete like everyone else, right? Two messages. He was prepared to recruit me differently, but then he held me to the, to the highest standard. I wasn't gonna get a free pass to this job. So I think the lesson is those of you who are in senior positions trying to recruit women, think about that. Secondly, if you are being recruited, uh, don't ask why you can't do it, which is what I was saying. Oh, I'm going to leave my friends. I don't like the weather in Edmonton. It's a bit cold. <laughs> you know, I mean, the list was a mile long. <laughs> Think about why you should do it. And that's my message. You know, and just building off of that, the, the, uh, the role that he took in your life, and you write about in the book the difference between a mentor and a sponsor. And I'm wondering if Martha could kind of elaborate on that. Building on this experience, I'm sure, I'm sure you've had similar experiences. You know, um, this was something we didn't know before we wrote the book. We knew what a mentor was. Everyone knows what a mentor is, right? A mentor is someone you select, you go to for advice and counsel. They usually are people you respect and trust, but they advise you. And it's an interaction, and it's an active interaction. But what's a sponsor? A sponsor is someone who you may or may not be aware of, but who knows about you and advocates for you, sometimes behind your back, sometimes where you're totally not aware of, but they sponsor you, and they put their name behind your name. So somebody who is extremely well-regarded who speaks out on your behalf to someone else, they listen because this person is well-regarded. And when we looked at our own careers, we began to recognize that while we had had mentors, sponsors far outweighed our career path. At every step of the way, somebody either known to us or most likely unknown to us and only discovered later had sponsored us had advocated for us, had nominated us, had pushed our name forward, had suggested that we be selected. Okay, my story very quickly on how important <coughs> a sponsor can be involves this woman right here. I was appointed U UBC's president, but I was still at the U of A because there was a transition period. And while I was there, a scholar from UBC came to give an address. And I thought, I better go. So I go, don't understand a word of what this man is saying. Amazing scholar, well-regarded, known throughout the world. I go up to him after the lecture, and I introduce myself. He could have cared less. But he says to me, I have one piece of advice for you. I said, what's that? Keep your eye on Indira Samara Sacra. She's amazing. OK? Now, I don't forget that name. That's an interesting name, right? <laughs> I go to UBC. Three years go by. I never meet Indira. She's busy doing her scholarship. She's an incredible scholar. Wins everything. I know her by reputation. I'm in awe. I'm now looking for a vice president of research. The application comes across my desk. 
She hasn't been a dean. She hasn't been an associate vice president. She hasn't been a vice president. She hasn't been an assistant, anything. <laughs> <laughs> She's been a scholar. Would I have looked at her application for a vice presidency? No way. I see the name, ding dong, I remember. And the man who had advocated for her was held in such high regard. There was no way I couldn't look at her. I take her to lunch and the rest is history. Now the best part of this story is Indira had no idea this had happened until we wrote the book. Wow. Yeah, until we know. wrote the book, she had no idea. Sponsors work in mysterious ways. So how do you get a sponsor? You do what you do as best as you can. You just keep doing what you do as best as you can. You excel and you make yourself known. How many times do you go to a dinner and you don't say anything? How many times do you go to a committee meeting and sit there quietly and don't say anything because you're afraid? You have to interject. You have to intervene. You have to make people notice you in a way that makes them think, wow, she's, she's pretty impressive. So it's not real complicated and you won't know who they are, but I can tell you now I'm trying to sponsor as many women as I can. Mm -hmm. So if any of you want to sponsor, <laughs> you just let me know, send me a little bio and I'll put you on my list. Yeah. That's really powerful. And I think it's really important in this room because we have a lot of senior uh, leadership here. Um, so what, you know, what can we do to sponsor yeah. those around us? You yeah. know, Charlotte, one of the things that in my experience and all sorts of things, men do it very well. They sponsor each other. I, you oh. know, how many, you all know that they're always out there talking about Joe. You know, you should think about Joe. You should think about Al. What about him? He should be on the board as women. We don't yeah. do it as well. Yeah. So if nothing else, now in your positions of leadership, sponsor people who you see who have the potential to really make a difference. You know, my, my next question takes a little bit of a, of a different turn. Given the, the level of crisis and repeated crisis that we've all faced over the last two years, um, you write in the book about crisis and responding to crisis. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about when do you identify this is truly a crisis how do you know, how do you remain calm in the face of a crisis? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're laughing. So. You don't. So, you don't. Yeah. so um, maybe I'll take that and then my, this one will both share because I think you have a story too. So very quickly, the first thing you do is, you know, sometimes you can never prepare for a crisis, but you need to recognize it as soon as possible. You don't wait and it gets away from you. Secondly, you have to be prepared to uh, get as much good advice as you can, but then you have to act. You can't sit around saying, oh, I can't make a decision. Uh, this is when the nerve comes. And thirdly, you have to do what's in the best interest of the institution, the organization. And you can't allow just the noise and the chatter and all of the criticism and everybody's upset to affect your ability to make a decision. And I'll tell you my story very quickly because it also involves understanding who's the boss. Mm -hmm. Because everybody has a boss and in the middle of the crisis, you need to know who your boss is. Because if your boss is not happy with you, you ain't gonna survive. <laughs> Doesn't matter if it's a lousy boss or whatever. So the story very quickly, University of Alberta, we had had good funding we were talking about this last night. And then un, un, uh, 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 without any warning, the government of Alberta gave us a budget cut and we had to solve the problem shortly because we were not allowed to run a deficit. Anyway, fabulous VP finance. We had a plan. We knew what we were going to do. We didn't want to act precipitously. We were going to take a little bit of time, but we had a plan. Well, the campus was outraged about the cuts and I was to blame, right? I mean, after all, I didn't do enough to get this cut reversed. And people on the board of governors, as you know, the board is the is my boss. And on it are faculty, there are students, there are academic staff, there's non-academic staff, everybody. And one of the fac academic faculty members 
had written a public note to the board saying that the morale on the campus had never, ever been worse. Wow. He was saying, as a boss, I was incompetent. I was not managing this crisis. The media was involved. It was like, OK. So I had to make a decision. I went to my boss, who was the chair of the board, who represented the, 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 the entire boss. And I said, Doug, at the next board meeting, I will present the strategic plan to deal with the thing. I will leave the room. You will find out whether there is unanimous support for my job as president. If, you, if there isn't unanimous support, I will resign in an hour. And you should find someone else. Because wow, in a crisis, you need the leader to be supported by the followers and their boss. It was a long two hours. <laughs> it my team, so difficult. My team thought I had lost it mm. by offering my resignation. And I said, no, it's not about me. It's about what's right for the institution. They need a leader who, who people can have confidence in. And if I'm not that leader, I should be out of here. So crisis management requires a whole series of steps that require nerve. You know, if you only read one story in the book, read that story. Because when Indira again told me that story, when we were looking at how we, what stories we were going to tell, I couldn't believe it. And I said, I never would have had that nerve. Never. That is nerve. And the understanding of who your boss is is extremely important because you can be right and most of the time, your boss is often wrong. Mm -hmm. But the boss will prevail. And if you can't, as in Indira's case, if you cannot agree with your boss, if, if it is so, you have such disharmony, and you can't, your principles will not allow you to do what the boss is telling you, then you have to leave. But most of the time, it's a compromise. Yes. Most of the time. 95% yes. of the time, it's a compromise. And you have to give and take. And and I can't under I can't overestimate the importance on crisis management of knowing when it's a crisis. My my story very simply was right after 9/11, we had a scholar who went out, and this is like two days after 9/11, went out and said that the United States caused this. Now, they gave a lecture saying the reason that 9-11 happened was that U.S. has terrible foreign policy and they brought it on. Now, maybe in hindsight, you know, if you read the lecture today, it makes sense. But I'll tell you, after 9-11, it was raw. And the calls that I received regarding her, or it was a woman, were just extraordinary. She had to be fired. She had to, I got calls from the government. I got calls from the media. I got calls from donors. And I didn't understand the crisis because I thought she had the right to say what she was going to say. She had academic freedom, which we in a university is sacred. It's sacred. We sent her speech out to the lawyers to see whether it was hate. That was the first thing I did. The morning when my, I'm confronted at 7.30 in the morning by my VP external and my government affairs people and my marketing and my publicist and my legal team all sitting in my office at 7.30, that's not a good sign. <laughs> and I said, okay, send it out. It wasn't hate. And I went at, at 11.30 in the morning, I said, not a problem. She has the right to say it. We'll defend academic freedom to my death. Was I wrong? No. I wasn't wrong in the fact that I defended academic freedom. I was wrong in the fact that I didn't understand that at that moment, nobody cared about academic freedom. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody. Timing. Yeah. And it's understanding what others perceive as the problem rather than your interpretation of the problem. And it got out of control because I didn't act soon enough. So, you know, it's always how it's perceived. You may not think it's a crisis, but try to put yourself in the shoes of whoever is affected by whatever is going on. And you can always manage it better if you get out in front of it. 
such powerful stories. I think a lot of lessons to be learned just from just from those two stories. And I wanted to kind of bring it down into the day to day uh, interactions with others. Um, and this relates to you write in the book about um, the likability factor. And, you know, certainly in, in crisis, you know, you mentioned in your story, like it didn't matter. It was about the institution. It wasn't about me. Right. And, and so dialing it down more in terms of our interpersonal interactions and this notion of likability factor. And I really like the differentiation you guys make between wanting to be liked and needing to be liked and how that can you tell us a little bit more about that and how that impacted your careers. Do you see it impacting others? Martha, you you articulate that really well, the need and the want. So I'll let you, and then I can add if there's any need. Uh, everybody wants to be liked, right? We all want to be liked. And and again, I don't want to generalize, but I'll put it in my own terms. I think as women, we believe, and I think there's some truth to it, that if we consult and we collaborate and we listen and we bring everybody into the fold and we are consensus builders and we're good managers, we'll be liked, right? Those men who just manage from top down, they're not gonna be liked, but we'll be liked because we do it differently. And that was what I thought when I went to UBC. I was gonna do it differently. I was gonna listen to everybody. I was gonna consult. I was gonna collaborate. I was gonna, you know, and I'd come up with an, a, a solution that everybody would like. Well, how likely is that? <laughs> it's not likely. And as soon as I made a decision, that first decision, and found that people didn't like it, they didn't like the decision I made, even though I had consulted and collaborated and tried to get consensus, I took it personally. I thought, oh my gosh, I did it wrong. Is there something wrong with me? Well, I hadn't done it wrong. I got to the right decision, but I was interpreting it, their response as a personal response. I was needing them to like me instead of needing them to respect me, okay? There's a big difference. You know, I say, it's kind of like the Godfather. It's not personal, it's business, mm -hmm. right? And that's what you have to remember. Don't give up on the consulting and the collaborating and the consensus building, that is one of our strengths. But you will reach a point where you have to make a decision. I don't care whether you're, whatever you're leading. You can be leading in your family. You can be leading in the community. You have to make a decision. And you won't always make everyone happy. And don't take their reaction as a personal affront. It's an affront to the decision, which is different than you as a person. So you can't need to be liked. You can want to be liked, but you can't need to be liked. Very powerful. I think uh, for me, a big lesson, you know, needing and wanting and, and thank you for that. How, how through your lives did you interact with people that particularly um, impacted, impacted you? Like are there, are there significant people or significant relationships that shaped you as a person? Yeah, I mean, I think this comes back to the mentor sponsors, mm -hmm. right? I think, uh, I think back on my my father. Uh, I think back on uh, my thesis supervisor. I think back on colleagues at, at a board table. Maybe that might be more relevant for this discussion. Um, when I went when I went on the board of Bank of Nova Scotia, uh, what I knew about banking you could have stuffed into a thimble. Right? Like, I mean, geez, engineer. I'm a metallurgical engineer. I, you know, I know interest rates, but that's about it. <laughs> Business people here. But what I learned was that there are people that you learn to observe and you are inspired. And on the bank board, there were a couple of people when I first joined the chair of the board and some of the colleagues whose questions were so, so brilliant. <laughs> who seem to know exactly how and when to intervene, who had a style that was not taking the, all the oxygen out of the room. And I think in all of our lives, we identify these people and you watch them and you, you really learn from them. And so for me, that's been my kind of approach 
is figure out who is making an impact and what are those qualities. You don't have to be the person who's talking all the time. That's actually the wrong thing to do. But look at those people who are advancing institutions or agenda. And whatever, whether it's a, a, a company or an institution or a nonprofit organization, look at the leaders that are moving the needle and find out what is it that makes them stand out. That's kind of been my... Approach. What about the opposite of that? Well, let me just jump in a mm. little, just real quickly on, on who you can look to. You don't need to know them. They can be people that you have admired in history. So I'm crazy about Eleanor Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. I've read everything you can think of about this woman. And I know everything about her. And, and she inspired me in a way and if I, you know, when some people ask, who would you want to have lunch with? It would be Eleanor Roosevelt. No, hands, hands down, okay? And I never knew her. She was long gone before I was a young girl. But I've read every book about her. I know what everything, I think I know everything she thought about. She was an amazing woman. And so there, you can find people. I mean, I, the, clearly there were people like my, my father, my husband, and all, the, all those people who are extremely important to you that are day to day. But they can be other people too, you know. Other people who turn you off, is yeah. that what you're Yeah, saying? like, a, like a, this, this notion. <laughs> it's a good, <laughs> you say it better than I, but the idea of, you, you talk about grit and grace. And you talk about grit and grace like in the context of, of difficult bosses and in the context of perhaps less, uh, less fluid relationships. And I'm, so that, that's what I meant by the opposite of that. So observing others around you, maybe you talked a little, we talked a little bit earlier about bosses, but what's the importance of the grit and the grace in the context of those kind of difficult relationships? So I think, you know, I mean, we talk in the book about grit is what you need. Grace is how you react, mm -hmm. right? And I think the grit and grace, when you have difficult relationships, you have to find the nerve to do what you need to do, but you have to, you have to do it gracefully. And I'll just tell two quick stories. One was, and this would apply to many of us, you go into meetings and you'll notice that the men sometimes dominate the meeting. And I was in a committee meeting uh, where there were people across the country and there were two women and we could not get a word in edgewise because there were two guys who were very famous and had built companies and they went, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and what do you do, right? You, you, you know, this is again, someone who's eliciting the opposite. That there's a behavior you don't want to emulate. In the meantime, you can't get a word in edgewise. <laughs> and the chair was not doing their job. So what did I do? After a couple of these meetings, I called the chair. So that Joe Rotman, actually, was Rotman School of Business Joe, famous Joe Rotman. And I said, Joe, I don't know whether you've noticed, but, you know, Genevieve and I can't even get a, a, a word in. And, you know, Mike here talks all the time. And John <laughs> just does not want to listen to anything we say. <laughs> and he said, oh, my goodness, Indira, thank you. I realize what you say is true, and I am going to pay attention. And after that, every time I saw Joe, he would introduce me as, this is the lady who told me how to <laughs> chair a meeting. So there was grace in that, right? I didn't phone him up and rant at him and get upset and say, how dare you? You're discriminating against me. You know, I'm a brown Asian woman. You're putting me down. None of that. None of that victim thing. It was about gently and politely calling him. I'll stop with that story. Um, well, I, you know, I think it's our secret weapon uh, as women. And I think you can see so many examples of being gracious when you're confronted with people who are difficult, who uh, could be, you know, somewhat recalcitrant, who take a position, who will speak out at you. You know, my story in the book is I had six labor unions and they all were on strike. And uh, they weren't real happy with me. And, 
you know, we were controlled by the government. There's not a whole lot of movement. But what did I do? I did against everyone's, my legal opinions, my chancellor, who had been the chief justice of the uh, appellate court of British Columbia, they all said, don't, you can't meet with these people. I said, I'm meeting with them. I held a big forum in the Chan Center. Those of you who know UBC, big auditorium. They came in with their mega horns and their bull horns and their, you know, placards and uh, pipers paid too much and whoever pays the piper and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And it was tough. But I stood there and I listened and I could, I tried to understand their frustration. And I tried to explain as best I could the limitations I had and the understanding of how valued they were. I tried to be gracious, as difficult as it was, because I was the target. But allowing yourself to be the target and responding not in a mean, aggressive, yeah. vindictive way, but a thoughtful way, without giving ground, I mean, we didn't give them a lot of money. We didn't have the money. I didn't change my position, but I listened. And I could feel the tenor of that auditorium going down and people starting to be quiet. And while, as I said, I didn't win the day, they still were on strike and I still had difficult negotiations. I think I, got, I garnered their respect mm -hmm. by being gracious. Thank you for that. Um, I, I've, I've gotten the cue that we should move to Q and A, but I do want to ask one last question. If, if uh, so, let's talk. I, I want to delve a little deeper into nerve and ask a, a simple question. I think, um, but very complicated in the answer, which is, is nerve the same for everyone? And I ask this question, you know, grounded a lot in my research, which which approaches um, intersectionality and work opportunities from looking at historically marginalized communities. And so I just reading your book, I kept thinking to myself, there's so many great lessons here, and I want to hear it from, from you both. Is nerve the same for everyone, or are there differences? Well, I think, first of all, you know, everyone comes at it differently based on where they're at, right? And I think it has almost, I believe, it is unique to the individual and less so about maybe differences. And I say that because one of the things we have to do is to now stop looking at history about all of the, you know, we can say, you know, and there's no question, women have been discriminated. Even today it's happening. Women of color, you know, indigenous women, the list is long. But we've got to look forward. And I'll tell you what, today on boards of corporate boards, there isn't a single board that I've been on, and it's common, that's not looking for women, diversity. I mean, it is the white men are being told, you've had your turn. Let's face it, you're not going to get on a corporate board because we need to. So that the tide has changed, and it's time to change the channel of conversation and empower women saying, okay, the opportunities are now there. You have to find the nerve to step in the door irrespective of the historical background, whether you were marginalized, whether you, whatever it is, because everyone has had some level of challenge, irrespective of whatever it is. So I, you know, I think it's time to move ahead. As Martha very eloquently says, and I'm gonna let you say. What, what am I gonna say? About, <laughs> we read each other's minds. Uh, about all the, all the barriers that have been removed. Oh, for sure. We always talk about yeah, that. But, but let me just say, I think nerve is a, a synonym would be being true to yourself. Yeah. And, and being principled and never giving up on your principles. You know, I have, when I was appointed president of UBC, I was scared to death. I was just petrified. And I expressed this to a very good friend of mine in Edmonton. I said, oh my, I, I don't know how I'm going to do this job. I, I'm, I'm frightened. And she said to me three words that I have never forgotten. And she did a calligraphy for me, which is also over my desk with the Georgia O'Keeffe. 
and that was just be Martha. Just be Charlotte. Just be Indira. Just be Jill. Be yourself. Be true to yourself. That's nerve. Don't be swayed. So everyone will do it differently. Yeah. Everyone will define that differently. But when push comes to shove and when things get tough, don't try to be someone you aren't. Be yourself and be true to that and have the nerve to be yourself. Now, in terms of removing the barriers very quickly, you know, think back. You're all so young, but I think back about my grandmother and my mother. Who My mother was university educated, but, you know, was really discriminated against. Yeah. All Think of the barriers those women faced. Reproductive rights, marriage rights. They couldn't own land. They couldn't, some of them couldn't vote. They couldn't, you know, they couldn't be uh, divorced. They couldn't decide when or where they were having their children. They, they couldn't work. They had to quit work if they got pregnant. It, on and on and on. And I look at my daughters, and now I have a granddaughter. And I can tell you, things are better. So much better. And I ask women, what legislation would you like to see that isn't there now? The only one I can come up with is universal daycare. Okay? And hopefully we will get it. And I'm sure there are others. But if you think about that, the ball is now in our court. And, you know, Virginia Woolf said it in Room of One's Own back in 1921, I think was the date. And if you haven't read that book, you should read it. It's a little monograph. At the end of the book, she admonishes women. She says, what's the problem? We've had the vote now for three years, and women can go to Oxford and Cambridge for four years. We should be filling the halls of Parliament. hundred years later, how well are we doing? And who's to blame? And I'm not saying there isn't discrimination that still exists, but it's time for us to take the responsibility and step up, and you're all doing it, and we're so thrilled you're doing it, but, you know, get out there. Do it. It's all, it's all good. I gotta the world tell, will be better. i got to tell a Just Be Martha story. Got to tell this story. I was appointed vice president of research. Remember, I had no experience, right? First day on the job. That was nerve for me to appoint her. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of nerve. I go into my office, and there's this big envelope, president's office. Now, remember the day before I was a professor. This is a hell of a promotion right now. <sighs> I bet you there are instructions on how to do the job, because she knows that I don't know anything. <laughs> I open the envelope. In it is a Harry... Potter want. <laughs> Seriously. From the president of the University of British Columbia, a want with a little note. Dear Indira, welcome to the team. Let's make magic. Now, is that not... <laughs> Honestly, that to me exemplifies the notion of nerve and just be yourself and do it differently. I don't think there is a male president who would send their VPs <laughs> a war. And let me tell you, all the male VPs got them too. <laughs> <laughs> and they had to bring them to every meeting. And I would, you know, occasionally say, we need some magic here. But if you have your, get your wand out. <laughs> I was the only one who had the wand. Everybody else had left them at home. Anyway. Um, that, I mean, I have so many follow-ups, but I'm going to stop. And we'll, we'll, uh, we want to turn over to the question and answer period. Um, and we're going to be alternating between um, our community online who've joined us today, as well as everyone in the room. My colleague, Christina, We'll be walking around with the microphone, so if anybody has any questions, just signal signal to Christina. Questions, of course, can be asked in English or French, and will be translated by the our our team today. But I do have my first question. I, my that's why I have this so that the questions populate. Um, so my first question here is um, online question from Isabel, um, and she says, "You speak of the importance of mentors. Would you have advice to share on how to identify?" So she's talking here about the mentor, not the sponsor, and having the nerve to reach out. Oh, 
You've got a story. Yeah, yeah. you know. <laughs> a good one. It, it's finding people who you respect and trust and believe in. And my, the story I tell is I found a mentor and I reached out to him when I needed it. And his name was Don Mazankowski. Many of you probably know who Maz was or you're all so young, but he was a uh, minister of everything from Alberta, should have been prime minister, but he didn't speak French. And he was on the board of U of A when I was vice president research. And I went to him in a time of need to mentor me. And it was when I was approached about the UBC presidency. And I didn't know what to do and I didn't know who to ask about it because it was confidential. But I respected this man so much by his interventions at the board. And I, you know, I didn't really know him that well, but I knew him. <coughs> and I thought, this is, the, this is the man who will mentor me. And I went to him and I'll tell you the advice because I give it to women all the time. I said to him, Mr. Mazankowski, I've been approached to be president of UBC or to put my hat in the ring and I'm worried about it and blah, blah, blah. And he looked at me and he said, you know, you're lucky in life if maybe once or maybe twice, you'll be given an opportunity to do something that you will never have that opportunity again. He said, most opportunities you can figure out, I don't wanna sit on that committee, I don't wanna do this, it's the wrong time, my kids are too young, I can't move, blah, blah. He looked right at me, and this is a mentor. He said, if you wanna be president of the University of British Columbia, not president of any university, but president of the University of British Columbia, it's now, it will never come again. You'll be too old, you won't be right. That was the best advice I ever got, yeah. because I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have made the leap. And he mentored me, and I sought him out, because he was respected, he was intelligent, and I knew he would be confidential. It wouldn't get out. That's the other thing about mentors. Yeah. You need to have their confidence. Hello. Oh, sorry. Hello, my name is Sandra Motilva, and I am an alumni of the Sydney BBA program. And I have actually two questions. I don't know if I can ask both. <laughs> so um, one of them, I am a, a scholar. We talk about scholars. And uh, I introduced myself actually like a scholar practitioner. And I found that there is an undermining of being a scholar in certain environments because you don't have experience. And um, so my question is, which kind of nerve do I have to have? Because actually, I am not out there. I am very focused on my research, in my publication. So which kind of nerve do, we, do you have to have in order to, to not react? Or, or how to react when somebody undermines you? As an scholar, I think that <laughs> um, you know Indra was very had a response for like Martha, and uh, that is not my case, right? So I think you know I think get back to Martha's uh, point about first of all not to take it personally. Uh, there are one of two possibilities: they either they either undervalue what you're doing or there's genuine discrimination. And I think the important, the important approach is to create a sense of the value of scholarship and to talk about it generally in a way when you have a conversation with that person about the fact that you are passionate about the work that you're doing because it's going to advance A, B, C, D, and that you hope that combined with experience that you'll be able to make a difference. And just simply do that. And don't let it get under your skin. I know that's easy to say. It take, took a long time before I would. I, I got to the point where I was comfortable. But you just have to develop that. Because otherwise, every single comment that everyone makes becomes something you, you stew over and allow it to, to undermine you. Read the book. Read the story about Indira getting her PhD and what her supervisor insisted that she do. Now, another woman might have said, he's making it tougher for me than for my male colleagues. And, and what she had to do is, a, is phenomenal. And 
the resistance she met when she went to the steel company in, in Edmonton is amazing. And yet, somehow, you dug deep, uh, found the nerve to, to just do it and to do it well. And I think that's trying to get the white noise out of there, trying to not take it personally is really important. My other question, sorry, is um, I, I spent some time in the USA, especially in the community of Chicago, and I found that racialized women are into the aspect of helping their communities. Like, for example, black women are helping more women that are racialized. And in fact, myself, I am a Latina, mm -hmm. and I found support there mm -hmm. for my research and my, my work, which I am not finding here. Um, and we are talking about inter intersectionality. And uh, so how, how Canadian women, there is something about Canadian women supporting more racialized women, especially from their communities, because I am not, I am a Canadian woman, I am getting support as a Latina from the Latina, Latino community in the USA. Well, I mean, I think this is a great opportunity for, for this school of business, right? Uh, I mean, I'm finding more and more of these networks that bring together women of all kinds, racialized women, women of different ethnic groups and so on, to help them build a network. Because what it is is about a network that supports you. Like you said, you went to Chicago and you know there were groups of uh, black women and, and, and other minorities. And I think, fortunately, Canada is a country of minorities. We may not have aggregated the capacity. So Christina, I don't know where she is. There you are, right? I mean, these are programs that I think are hugely important right now because the opportunities are there and it's about giving women the confidence to overcome whatever barriers in order to be able to flourish. So we'll do one, one question from, uh, from online. Um, and this actually came during registration. I was very eager for today. Uh, what was your greatest asset in establishing your credibility as a woman leader? So oh other than grit and grace, you notice being authentic. What would you say? Hard greatest? work. <laughs> and I think the other asset is, uh, and this I learned from my PhD supervisor, never settle for good enough. Mm. Never settle for good enough. He always said to me, if you put out a publication or you stand up and speak or you do anything, be sure that it is of the highest standing, right? Because that's how you become known. That's how people think that you are capable, which means doing your homework and being relentless in the pursuit of excellence. That's it. Question, and then you can carry this over into our networking discussion afterwards. Thank okay. you. So before I ask my question, I will just share quickly my experience. I've been in the federal government for quite some time, and I have been the only black executive in many departments. So I created a network okay. of black executive women a few years ago. And, you know, but again, you know, if it's not there, seek, seek yes. them and create your right. own. Thank you both. I would like to hear, uh, share your thoughts on pursuing opportunities. Um, how do we make sure that, you know, we're looking at the right uh, area in the right areas, or even, you know, how do we expand our experiences? Uh, both of you have dealt, you know, have stepped into areas that may have not been your core uh, knowledge or business. How do we get out and seek those opportunities? Well, we talk about, and, and I should have Indira answer this, but I, I, I want to be sure she answers it the way I think she should answer it. <laughs> and that is I do what we, Martha tells me. We, we talk about serendipity. Yes, that's right. Serendipity, yes. which is different than luck. Right. And, and she'll tell you where it came from. It came from the island of Serendip, which is was Sri Lanka, blah, blah, blah. 
but it's called, and there's been a lot written about it. Yeah. So Harvard Business Review, you can find books, books on it. But it's what they call being a super encounterer. It's someone who sees things, little clues, and puts them together. And other people ignore those clues, and they miss the opportunity. And when we, again, began looking, we realized that serendipity had played a real role in our lives. And here's my example. When I graduate, I have my PhD at, from McGill in epidemiology and biostatistics. That's what I wanted to do. That's what I was going to do. I didn't want to be a physical therapist. I wanted to be an epidemiologist. Well, I get a call. They're looking for a director of the School of Physical and Occupational Therapy at McGill, and I'm the warm body, the only person in the faculty of the country that has a PhD. Please do this job or, you know, apply for it. No way. So I wasn't interested. But then I began to see the dots. Yeah. My PhD supervisor says, you know, if you really want to change something, you can do it better leading than you can writing a whole bunch of articles. My you know, I began to look at the Faculty of Medicine at, U, at McGill and realized there were some incredible people I could learn from. I began to see that this might work in my family and my situation. I put the dots together. Yeah. Where I would have just passed, put it away because it wasn't on my, plan, my game plan. Yeah. It took me in a totally different direction. Was that an opportunity like Indira? I wasn't guaranteed, but it was a, a piece that I would typically never have thought I was going to do. I didn't want to be associated with physical and occupational therapy. I didn't want to lead anything, but it was all the dots. And that's what I think. And, and Indira's got some wonderful stories in the book. Serendipity, be a super encounterer. Go to, the, go to places you normally wouldn't go. Accept invitations you normally wouldn't accept. You never know whom you're going to meet and how that's going to change. Uh, just a quick story. Uh, two days after I retired, there was a conference in Vancouver. I'd moved back to, La it's an Australia-Canada conference. I'm no longer university president. What do I need an Australia-Canada conference? I'm, <laughs> I'm exhausted. I just want to go to bed and put the covers over my head. I went. I'm sitting next to Derek Burney, former ambassador to the United States, Canadian ambassador. He says, what are you doing now? Well, you know, I just retired two days ago. And well, oh, he says, three months later, my phone rings. And it's a headhunter. Uh, are you interested in a large cap company in Alberta? Do you, are you interested in a directorship? And I went, tell me more. TransCanada. I said, sign me up. I looked at who the board, uh, the CEO was. I looked at the board members. Incredible company. And I wanted to have a connection to Alberta. Then I found out Derek Burney was chair of the Governance and Nominations Committee. Mm -hmm. That encounter triggered his memory that I was available. I could have laid in bed with the covers over my head. <laughs> <laughs> Serendipity. That's unfortunate. We're at the end of our time, um, and there's so many questions coming in, and I know that some of you have. And so well, there'll be some for those with us here today that we can, you know, mingle afterwards and perhaps uh, have some uh, some more questions, some more chatting. Thank you so much, Martha and Indira, for being with us. It really was, you know, I read the book, I was inspired, and now even more inspired from the conversation. So thank you so much for being with us this morning. And. I And also, also, thank you all for taking the time to be with us. It, it really is wonderful to see, to be back in person, to be together, to be able to exchange in this way. And for those online as well, thank you. So as we continue to offer hybrid alumni events, we, we would really like your thoughts on how today went. And so there will be a survey shared. And also on, for those online, there will be a link shared. And with that, um, you know, we're coming to a close. So please join us for some refreshments outside. Thank you.